you design an organization that you think is the right target structure to be heading for, but then the reality of, well, you know, what about the people we have in place and where do they fit in this? Or, uh, you know, are we able to attract the right kind of skill sets into this organization? What's the reality of our ability to attract the, the level of talent we need uh, comes into play? Hey, welcome to Unleashed. I'm your host, Will Bachman. We just heard from today's guest, Umbrex member Stephen Redwood. Stephen has been a partner in the organization practices at PricewaterhouseCoopers, McKinsey & Company, Oliver Wyman, and Deloitte. He's now running his own firm, Redwood Advisory Partners, where he helps clients develop a high-performing organization and an exceptional employee experience. In today's discussion, Stephen explains what an organizational design project is all about, and he also discusses his other business, Tri Endeavors, where he coaches elite triathletes. To learn more about Stephen's triathlon coaching practice, visit triendeavors.com, and that's T-R-I endeavors.com, one word. And to learn more about Stephen's consulting practice, visit redwoodadvisorypartners.com, and those links are in the show notes. If you like this episode, consider signing up for the Unleashed email. Each week, I'll send you a summary of recent episodes, some recommended reading, and consulting tips. To sign up, visit askunleashed.com. Hello, Stephen. Welcome to the show. Hi, Will. Thanks for inviting me along. Um, great to be part of this. Stephen, what is a common misconception that people have about what an organizational consultant does? So it's an interesting question because I think when people think about an organization design consultant, uh, they tend to think about um, boxes and lines on a chart. And so the kind of core structure of the organization, which really represents um, in solid form something that's much more complex than what it looks like on paper. I mean, organizations are dynamic sets of connections between people and things they do and the effect of the organization is to essentially provide a kind of skeleton around which the the organization hangs um and you know what so i think the the common misconception is that it's just a simple question of boxes and lines on charts but of course how well the organization operates depends on a whole range of factors because essentially you're redistributing power across the organization when you change the structure. Um, And so how leaders operate through the structure, how people respond to their place in the structure is all part of the dynamic and how work is linked up and, and flows across the structure as well is another important component. So to think only in terms of boxes and wires means if you if you focus on it in that way, I mean, it's a kind of simple job, but the knock-on consequences of where you get to in terms of what you put in place are much more complex than that. So g- give me a, a list of the types of things an organizational consultant would get involved in. So, I mean, you mentioned and referred to, you know, the boxes and wires. So defining roles, defining responsibilities, and reporting relationships, but it's it's so much more than that. What are, what are sort of the other elements that you as an organization consultant would assessing and 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 helping to to design? Yeah, I mean, I think there's a one end, there's a simple checklist, and then there's kind of complications around it. But I mean, on the simple checklist side of things, you, I mean, there's the, the roles and responsibilities. There are the spans of control that people have at different points in the organization. Um, There is um, the set of um, metrics and goals that you set up for roles within that organization. Um, There are considerations about what is the value of a particular job at a different point in the organization? How do you reward it? Then there is the overall cost of the organization as well. So, it, you know, that's maybe not all, but it's it's pretty it's probably like 80 percent of the things that are on the kind of checklist that you have to think about in terms of the structure, because what you're doing in, in going through those different activities is thinking, A, what is a particular role in the organization? And then how do I weight it in terms of its importance and therefore 
how do I value it in terms of what I provide to the individual and what skills and capabilities are going to be required, um, ideally, uh, to fill that position. Um, that's the kind of simple side of it, I guess. I think the, the, less, the less simple, more complex side is the politics of organizations, because as I said earlier, you're kind of redistributing power across an organization, both within the employees um, in terms of how they operate within it uh, individually and collectively, uh, as well as, um, as you would expect uh, in terms of leaders and how much control and responsibility they have too. And what interests me a lot about these kind of situations is these kind of projects is how how much power is not taken into consideration that's basically devolved down through the organization depending on how engaged and motivated employees are because you could have theoretically a, a great organization in place and you could theoretically the power structures amongst leaders in place but if you haven't taken into consideration what the nature of work and the environment that people operate in down through the organization looks like. You, you could well have a situation where people are not either giving it their best or, or worse, actively disenchanted, disengaged. And uh, you, you, know, you end up with an inefficient uh, structure with overhead that's probably not adding much value if it's not encouraging those employees to feel like they want to do their piece. So when you first become aware of a, of a potential need at a client, what are the types of reasons that someone is calling you to, to have an initial discussion? Uh, you know, in some cases, yeah. perhaps they, they have something very explicit, but in some cases, I'm, I, I can imagine CEOs might be saying that there's, you know, the organization we've grown and it's just not working quite right. I don't know what the answer is, or I don't even know what the exact problem is. Tell, tell us for, uh, a little bit about the types of reasons that you'll get called in. It's, it's, it's event, it t- tends to be event focus. Um, so if I kind of cast my mind back through projects I've done in the past, uh, you know, in, in many cases, there's been a change of leadership, a new CEO or a new head of uh, business unit. And, you know, if you're in that kind of senior role, there's only so many levers that you can actually pull uh, in the organization uh, before you run out of options and have to just rely on the organization doing their piece. So, you know, you think about it as a new CEO, you can redeploy resources and budgets and allocations, things like that, and change your leadership team. You can change your strategic direction you can change the structure and then you're kind of out of options beyond that beyond hoping that people will do their piece so structure is one of the easiest things at least conceptually for a ceo or a new business leader to utilize as a technique to put their stamp on the organization to redirect things and the flow of work and the priorities that they give to the organization. So that kind of event is very common. Other events are like, you know, a new acquisition where a new uh, substantial chunk of the organization uh, is brought into the organization. And the question there often is, do we keep this as an adjunct um, or do we fold it in? And how would we, how would we make up our mind one way or the other? You know, I recently, uh, you know, kind of, less kind of event focused reason might be just a point in growth so i recently did some work with a company where they just reached a point in growth where they felt like they were still operating under the kind of structures that they'd been using since they started out as a company almost Um, and things have kind of grown over time and new things have been put in place um, and they all made sense at the time but when you step back and looked at them collectively you you know, they were thinking, well, maybe it's not as efficient and effective as it might be. So let's just step back and have a look at how we should organize ourselves for the next phase of growth. And then, of course, you've got, you know, the all too sadly common situation in which companies are struggling and they're on the other side of the curve and they have to think about, well, how do we how do we deal with the fact that we 
the, the the structure is just carrying too much cost for the organization and how can we reorganize uh, to make it fit better with you know where we see our particular market going and the economics of the business what are some mistakes that leaders make when they think about making changes to an organization yeah so it's a challenging one I, you know i think the the single biggest mistake is to believe that you know one you're one and done that you know you're putting in place a structure and that's that's the structure that is going to work for you going forward and it will solve all of your problems um and of course it's it's just one component of that dynamic that i was talking about earlier so i think oversimplifying and over expecting the structure to kind of sort things out um across the board is is a big mistake perhaps a bigger mistake is that i'd say in pretty much a hundred percent of the projects i've worked on over the years not unreasonably you design an organization that you think is the right target structure to be heading for but then the reality of well you know what about the people we have in place and where do they fit in this or uh, you know, are we able to attract the right kind of skill sets into this organization? What's the reality of our ability to attract the, the level of talent we need uh, comes into play? And then there's the question of what about, you know, I'm. it doesn't matter how senior you are in the organization, there's two or three people you maybe kind of have a close connection to and you think, well, I don't want the, you know, the, this person to suffer or perhaps they have more leverage over you for some reason and so you start to make compromises and you kind of step by step um, end up not really having moved the needle very much and getting you know compromising your way back to almost you know where you are starting from and that is perhaps the biggest um, issue that I think organizations face and I you know I hope that my role by bringing my experience to bear and my willingness to speak up um, and their expectations indeed that I will do can steal them and give them more backbone in terms of just not not allowing all those compromises to come into play and undermining the quality of the thinking that's gone into planning where they should be getting to. What can go wrong in a, a organizational you know, project? Um, th- there's... There's so many things which can go wrong. I mean, there's, there's a ton of things, of course, which can go right. And, you know, for any one of those components that I talked about earlier, I guess, you know, they can go right or they can go wrong. You can have false expectations about your ability to recruit. You can, in your strategy or in your financial planning, you may have got it wrong in terms of your targets and expectations about where the business is going to go and therefore what weight you can carry in terms of the organization. You can, um, as I alluded to before, make compromises in terms of putting people in positions that because, you know, you want to keep them in the organization, which is perhaps laudable, but they're just not the right person for that role. And so personnel choices start to, you know, can go wrong but i think the probably the main thing which can go wrong is it's 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 um pretty commonplace to say communications are important but I, the the way in which you make the changes happen in the organization for better or worse they in terms of the impact they have on particular individuals can have a massive impact on the the workforce at large um and so you know, the, the process of change is as important, I would say, as the process of determining what the organization actually is going to look like. So for someone who's not an expert in organizational consulting, like me, what yeah. would some, uh, you know, let's say we're you know, serving senior leadership of a company on some other matter, strategy, let's say, or operations or marketing, mm-hmm. what are some kind of questions that we should have at the ready to you know to be to be asking the senior leadership to help uh questions related to organization that we should be asking uh just to help you know understand the organization but also to identify 
uh, potential uh, challenges in the current organization? I think top of the list is, well, what's not working now that needs to be working? So you kind of home in on what's the problem set that you're trying to solve for, which may lead you down a path which says this has actually got nothing to do with organization. It's got to do with maybe something else. But, you know, what's the problem you're trying to solve is is one question. You know, second question is what is um, changing about the business going forward that you need to accommodate? so that we can uh, better understand you know what what new activities and skills are needed within the organization going forward you know a quest- a third question is what level of change both in terms of cost but also in terms of p- impact on the organization can you accommodate uh, over you know what what period of time so that you get a sense of this is something which needs to be where the load needs to be spread over a longer period, um, or this is more of a big bang needs to happen in the short term, and also get a sense of what's the scale of change you should be planning for. And uh, uh, maybe a fourth big question is what is what is the level of engagement going to be of senior leaders in taking this forward, because Setting something like this off and running and then not staying engaged just means that people will not give it the importance and significance that perhaps it deserves. And um, as you know, we all know far too well, you know, if the senior person isn't paying attention to something, then, uh, you know, other people will pay less attention to it. So the, you know, the level of involvement of senior executives in and the CEO in particular, if this is an enterprise wide change in the exercise, really gives it the the power and the momentum uh, to keep it going um, and to ensure that people give it the attention that it deserves. So I think you know probably those are the big questions. I think I'd add one more though as a a consultant. I I always ask you know, what is so complex about this problem that you need to bring someone in from the outside? Um, so I get a sense of what they're struggling with um, and where I can, as a consultant and advisor to them, bring the most value. And for me, that's a really kind of crucial question to understand. Um, and, you know, that way you'll know, yes, where you can add the most value, but you'll also get a sense of, am I just being hired as a extra hand or am i being hired here as a change agent that's really being asked to help guide and advise them on something in a really important way that last question is uh is so useful not just for an organization type effort but for almost any type of consulting project yeah. so powerful to ask like you know it almost seems like we're arguing against you know, bringing in expert advice, but it's saying like, look, why are you looking outside the organization? What have you tried already internally? And, you know, what happened and what made you decide? What's the catalyst to go and look for some outside advisor? Because no one likes to spend money on some outside advisor if you can do it in-house and, and you shouldn't. So what's special about now? Yeah, I agree. I mean, it's it's been interesting in my career, the different roles I've had, you know, to see how easy or difficult it is for me to ask that question you know I've, I've got my own business now and it's very easy for me to ask that question and to, you know I've, clients appreciate it um, because they can see I'm trying to find a way the way in which I can be most helpful to them and that it's not uh, that I'm trying to just bring a scale up the project you know and and you know what's the biggest scale i can bring to helping you here it's more about well how can i be most targeted and most valuable in the belief that a that's a great outcome for the client and b that it'll strengthen the relationship that i have with them as well and they'll be more appreciative of it and it will be more sustainable um and in so doing for me you know a very important component of my work is 
you know, am I, you know, I always ask myself, is this a client I want to work with? Are these people that I will get some, some development from myself by experiencing working in their environment? And, and will I feel, forget about the, the financial side of it, but will I feel as a kind of rewarding quid pro quo, if you like, in, in the relationship so that I'm not getting myself trapped in a, you know, a kind of testy relationship with the client where they kind of begrudge having to bring in a consultant, uh, but rather I'm in a relationship where they see it must be much more of a collaborative partnership. And, you know, those are the kinds of consulting situations that I, I try and hold myself to and try and foster. You've been a partner at, you know, globally known top firms, you know, in leading their organization practices. You, uh, you've also spent several years as an independent consultant. Talk a little bit about the differences in your approach and, you know, what it's like for you uh, in those two different roles. Yeah, it's been a fascinating journey for me. I mean, I've been a consultant now for, I think, yeah, th- 31 years, I guess. And I guess in, in years, year two, I probably thought I'd got it. In year five, I probably thought I'd got it. And, every, and then realized in year one, I didn't. And here I am in year 30 thinking, do I really understand fully yet how to do this as effectively as I should be? And so it's one of the great things about being a consultant is the fact that you just um, – it's a continually evolving experience because the the business marketplace keeps changing. Um, And the experience of working with different clients, every client has something slightly unique about them. Um, So it's been a fascinating journey. And I think the difference between kind of big firm um, consulting and small firm consulting is as much as anything, it's about the, the nature of the relationship you have with the client. Um, so in in the smaller firm world that I'm operating in now, I feel uh, a, mo- a lot more of an intimate relationship, a much more personal responsibility in a way uh, to the client, and it's a much more authentic relationship. Uh, you know, Not to say it's not authentic when you're in a big firm world, but it's that much closer to you. It's much more about you uh, as, a, as an individual And therefore, there's that responsibility uh, you feel incumbent on you to really deliver for the client. And it it makes you face, therefore, the need to be really close to what they need, what they're doing. Uh, Whereas in a big firm, I guess, you know, you um, there's there's always the the added uh, difference of the fact that you're carrying a bigger brand name. The client looks at the brand name and they look at you. Often they're looking for something different when they go to a big firm, and, and that often takes the form of this is a big, hairy, uh, hairy uh, problem that needs um, a team of people working on it that's going to be big and we're willing to pay for it. Uh, but also, you know, we we want to feel the confidence of a big brand name um, behind it, and also the ability to have some comeback as well. So. There are different dynamics at play, and I think the great thing about that I've learned from playing in in both uh, pools is that you know you can th- there's a there's a huge range of different ways in which clients want to interact with consultants and use them, and they need all types: individuals, small firms, big firms, for different reasons. And the smaller it gets, I think the biggest difference, is, as I said, is that the smaller it gets, the more intimate it gets. And um, for me, at this stage in my career, that's a, you know, it's a, it's a great feeling to have because you feel as though you can really bring your experience to bear uh, without having to, I, I guess, you know, bring, without having to mix it with a ton of other alternative views that you might have to bring to the table. When, when you're in a much bigger partnership or organization. In addition to, in addition to your career uh, as an organization consultant, you are also a endurance athlete and you serve as a coach to endurance athletes. Tell me about that side of your life. Yeah, it's been um, I, I really a really core part of my identity, I guess, since I was a young kid. I was, I was um, a rower in my younger days or in the u.s you say you know i did crew and um 
I, so I've always been doing endurance sports and then a, a good few years ago now, I guess maybe uh, eight or 10 years ago with one of my daughters, who was a great runner, we, she needed a bit of a change of uh, direction because she was getting injured so much from all the run training and so needed something that would spread the load more. And so she and I said, let's give triathlon a go. And so it was really just a continuation of a life of doing endurance sports for me. And I got into triathlon and um, I've been really um, deeply involved in that for the last uh, 10 years or so. And along the way, I've done a ton of Ironman distance races. I've done, I think, 16 or 17 now and similar sort of number of half Ironman distance races. And it's been um, it's been a great experience for me because you know the nature of endurance sport is that it really drives it really tests your resilience your persistence tests the limits of and usually goes beyond what you think you can do um and um so it's hard for it not to be rewarding you know when you kind of experience having taken on something that is a massive challenge and then getting through it and um so in the last few years i i also got into coaching others as well which in itself is super rewarding and you know i found there's a there's a a relationship between what i do in the endurance sport world and what i do in organizations as well um and it's it's interesting to kind of think about it because the you know a big challenge for people individually is if I want to do this thing that's going to be very demanding on, on my time and my body in endurance uh, terms, how do I make the time for it? How do, I, how do I do the training? How do I structure it so that I, I, can, I can do this in amongst the rest of the demands of my life, stay healthy, avoid injury? Um, and that brings into question a whole range of things around recovery, nutrition the volume and intensity of the training you're doing and how you stay motivated. So you kind of step back from that and say, well, doesn't a lot of this relate to what happens in organizations as well in terms of how do we keep people motivated? How do we ensure we're not overworking them so that there is sufficient recovery built into the way what, the way things operate and there's a, there's sufficient level of individual identification with what it is they're trying to do to perform and um, you know I love to think about that crossover between the two fields which and I think it's hugely relevant and you know just to kind of go off on a little bit of a tangent one of the tough things people find is in making in fitting endurance sport into your life the challenge if you're new to it is because it takes quite a volume of hours is to structure your time differently so you fit it in and to get through the early months of finding it really hard to get up in the morning say or to fit it in in the evening or at whatever point in your day on a regular basis because consistency is king And, and that's really about working your way through to the point where it becomes a habit and when I think about habit formation in the organizational context i think it's a super big problem that companies have when they're trying to bring about changes uh, because all too often leadership will set in 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 uh, play an organizational change say a restructuring and that and after a few months the leadership's attention will drift away from this thing onto the next thing they're looking ahead to and the and the people who are drive who are given responsibility for driving things forward feel that that lowered sense of focus and the energy slips out of the system and before you know it things have have lost steam or things have started to fall back into old habits in the organization because they haven't given enough persistence enough attention to how to make get through to that point where the organization has established new habits of how they work. Um, and I think that's a massive issue in organizations. And it really, I think, comes down to how they 
organize around being persistent to chase after the goals that they are looking to achieve um, organizationally. And that, you know, looks very like how do you do that as an individual when you've got a hobby that you're trying to achieve something big in because they both require some of the same sorts of <clears throat> mental outlooks. Does that make sense? Can you give an example of how you've uh, kind of helped coach an organization to build that organizational habit? Like what? Would... Yeah, I think um, I'm not sure that it, I don't think it's rocket science, but I but I think you know coaching an organization to build habits really revolves around how you hold influencers um, and leaders in the organization to a pattern which is you know reinforcing where you're trying to get to and so and that's that's you know about working with them uh, often enough or, or putting in place structures in say meetings um, or in their schedules which mean that time is put aside to continue focusing on this over the long haul. Um, it can be around how you put in place communication structures and systems which keep the themes alive and keep driving them forward. But it can also, well, it, is, it, it should also, I think, involve, you know, I mentioned the word influences. It's not just about leadership. It's about identifying people in the organization who can have influence and shape the way in which people think about things and engaging them in helping to move things forward and giving them the tools. And then if, you know, you, you, you know, around those kinds of activities, building in checkpoints, which, which are planned, you know, way out so that you really can step back and say, are we still bringing the same energy to it? Have we, have we, have we achieved uh, uh, the progress we need to? And you'll know about that through, I guess, a number of things. And, you know, I'm sort of digging way back in time to some of the early work I did in this space around, you know, what, so what do we measure in order to know if we're making progress? Well, you know, one is to have kind of performance goals. You know, are our performance metrics delivering what we expected them to deliver? Secondly, are people completing the activities we expected of them in terms of moving this thing forward so have the communications been happening have the meetings been happening have the changes that we planned for been happening um, and then the third is is the culture shifting and so you know you can kind of measure culture employee engagement things like that to determine if you've um, if you've been making progress you put those three things together is the culture shifting uh, are people doing the things that they, they said they would do? Uh, the activities happening? Uh, are the metrics improving? And you've got a pretty good way of triangulating around the way in which the organization is operating and you can track those things over time. So I think all of the above are the kinds of things that you can do in order to try and drive habit formation into the organization and get yourself to a new place. Tell me a little bit more about like how you actually work with endurance athletes when you're coaching them. So, you know, I, I imagine that you're not out there running alongside them as they do their 15 miles. Uh, what, how do you interact with people? What, what do you help them with? Uh, what's the whole process look like? So it's, uh, it's, it's kind of interesting because coming out of a uh, crew environment, a rowing environment, when I was younger, where you would literally have a coach in a launch alongside you watching what you're doing because you're trying to sync up a whole, you know, crew of people. Um, and um, so a lot of close personal attention and the endurance sports world is very different. Um, and so a lot of it enabled by modern, you know, technology enables you to use uh, software platforms to, develop plans for how to train people. So, you know, if I, I have an athlete, um, you know, the start point will be for me to figure out uh, in discussion with them, what's their history? What are they trying to achieve? Um, what's their capacity? 
um, and to map out a schedule of training, which will take them from where they are now to hopefully a peak performance in the event that they are uh, targeting. And along the way to build in the right kind of increases in loading on them and the recovery periods um, so that they're not overstressed. They're just hitting the right kind of level of uh, physical uh, stress that which is increasing over time. So it's driving up their fitness levels and, you know, fitness for purpose uh, without overdoing it. So, you know, there's a kind of planning side of it. Then there's a there's another side of it, which is to collecting data. And so, it's you know, these days, sport has become incredibly data focused. And so, you know, we're in a world now where there's all sorts of wearable technology and, uh, that can give you a massive amount of information. And so, you know, I'll be collecting from them, from devices they have, things like the amount of power output they, they have on a bike so that I can see what they're capable of sustaining over time of, ident- of, of, of mapping you know, how their heart rate responds to different loads um, and whether or not their capacity to operate at a higher level of heart rate um, is improving or not. And indeed, if, if um, there are signs from kind of heart rate uh, indicators that maybe they're overdoing it, on the other hand. Um, and then, you know, there's sweat rates to determine how much fluid they need to uh, take in. There's there's nutritional information about, you know, what are they doing in terms of helping to ensure that they're optimizing their internal system to provide the best you know, possible performance. Um, and so they, there's a whole raft of data input that I collect from athletes, which comes into the platform gets mapped against the training that I've uh, set for them. And I can see then, is this helping? Is it not helping? Do we need to tweak it or not? And then the third leg of it um, is um, this direct communication. So, you know, these are, these are human beings, not machines. And so, you know, regardless of what the data is telling you, they may be feeling good. They may be feeling bad. They may have an extra, you know, they may have things going on in their life beyond the training that need to be taken into consideration. Uh, they may be finding certain parts of the training going well or, you know, not going well. Adjustments need to be made. So, you know, I have kind of regular communication with them through both through the platform where they can write things or they can send me messages, but also just regular check-ins um, by, you know, by phone or by video conference things like that along the way so that there's this sense of relationship there because it's a very personal thing that they're they're doing um it's very important to them want to feel like you know you're you're really in tune with all aspects of their life in helping them to achieve their goals so it's quite a quite a quite a process i guess but it's also hugely rewarding when somebody really makes progress and achieves a personal goal it it's massively motivating for them and also hugely rewarding for me um and you know it's the same in that respect in achieving some kind of personal goal in a endurance event as actually it can be in an organization by saying hey i just i just did this thing and it's it's you know i've been trying to to do this in the organization for a long time and it's happened and you get this huge rush of energy so again there's kind of crossovers in terms of organizational life and personal life in thinking about uh, what you can take from the endurance world into organizations in that respect as well we've spoken some about habits what are some habits that you have incorporated in your own life you know, either a long time ago or recently that have really worked well for you? Well, I think one thing I've done in my work life, which has really worked well for me, is I've I've looked at my calendar every week and said, where do I need to be in the world on any particular day of the week? Particularly, you know, this is important if you're, you know, you're traveling a lot and so what adjustments do I need to make in order to ensure that I can get my my training done? 
And so that might involve instead of flying out early one morning or getting on a train early one morning, I would go, say, the night before so that that next morning I can get up and still get my training in and then do the work of the day. So one is just that kind of weekly look at an adjustment so that I'm ensuring that my habit of doing my training is not adversely affected more than absolutely necessary. You know, secondly, as I've you know, got, I guess, older, I've had to think a little bit more about how I may build the resilience in my my body and also in terms of just um, mental outlook. And so I, you know, I do much more stretching, you know, in a form of yoga or other types of um, stretching activities um, on a regular basis, like most days. I also do some meditation, you know, probably I you know I have my ups and downs with that uh, but I've been meditating on and off since I was a, a teenager and uh, so that's that's a great mechanism I find for keeping my head in the right place and then I think and you know one of my other strategies in life is that when I'm at my most busiest is when I'm most planful so when I've got a ton of of things uh, bearing down on me, I will sit down and I'll say, okay, number one, let's let's uh, break down each of those challenges into small steps so I don't get overwhelmed by the, you know, the size of the thing that I'm trying to get to. And uh, secondly, let's really map out time in my calendar for those things. Um, so when I've got the least on, I'm the least planful, I guess. And when I got the most on, I'm super planful. So you know, those are a few things that um, I do. I, I just one other thing maybe that I found uh, instructive to me many years ago when I first, um, first time around, I was running my own show. I, uh, I sat down, I thought, I should, I should take this opportunity to figure out what's important to me in life and what really brings me pleasure in life. And I drew up a list thinking, you know, that kind of half expecting that I'd I'd have a list of things which were kind of impossibilities. And I looked at the list and I thought, you know, that's a very simple set of things which really bring me deep pleasure and satisfaction. I can do any one of them if I if I want to. It's just a question of making time for them. And so that's carried forward in my life. And it's, you know, I guess, a simple idea, but it's, uh, you know, for me, it was really instructive. And so I give attention to uh, my life in terms of am I doing things which I want to do and that bring me satisfaction? And if not, then I need to make some adjustments. Um, and so along the way, you know, I stop and I'm quite reflective about that. Um, and I do some journaling, which helps me, I, you know, I enjoy writing. And so it helps me to kind of work things through and think about them. But I found that a great um, rem- constant reminder to me that I can, I can, you know, I've got the opportunity. I've been very lucky in life. And, and really, when it comes down to it, the things that bring me satisfaction don't require huge resources. They just require me to kind of do those things you know reading making music things like that you know doing sport steven where can people go to find out more information about your practice they can uh, thanks for asking uh will a few places one is my uh, consulting website which is uh, redwoodadvisorypartners.com the other is my triathlon coaching uh, website which is tryendeavors.com um, and then of course there's all the usual stuff uh, linkedin social media although i'm super patchy on that uh you know twitter and um pretty much twitter actually instagram i'm really bad on uh so really my websites and to some extent social media linkedin etc so we'll include those links in the show notes redwood advisory partners yeah.com and tryendeavors.com. We'll include those links in the show notes. Right. Stephen, it was great catching up with you and hearing about your work with endurance athletes as well as with organizations. Thanks so much for joining today. Thanks, Will. Always a pleasure talking to you. And um, yeah, thanks for inviting me along.
Thanks for listening to this episode of Unleashed. I'm your host, Will Bachman. If you like the show, I invite you to subscribe to the weekly Unleashed email where you'll get summaries of each recent episode, book recommendations, and consulting tips. To sign up, go to askunleashed.com or to shoot me an email at unleashed at umbrex.com and I will get you added to that list. Mm-hmm.